and prepare to listen to the main event, as it were, for this service. I'm talking about the talk by Reverend John Scott, our, our pastor. His topic this morning, he whispered to me earlier before the service started, is knowing God. And we all wait with not quite bated breath, but certainly with anticipation to hear Reverend John's thoughts on knowing God. Reverend John, our pastor. Thank you, Reverend Michael. Good morning, spiritual family, both here in beautiful Jamaica and on the World Wide Web. It's a joy to add my own words of welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I've been thinking a lot about knowing God. You know, the psalmist said, be still and know that I am God. And you may know, some of you, that I am currently conducting a, a, a class on Thursdays titled Ignite Your Life with Bible Wisdom. And again, at that first class, first couple of classes, and again uh, last Sunday at Discovery, I asked participants to share their favorite Bible stories, which we did. We had great fun, you know. And so the Bible has very much been on my mind and in my consciousness for the, the last few weeks. So I shouldn't have been surprised last Friday when I went to the bank and encountered the Bible in a very unusual way. You see, there was no space in the banking hall, and so a very kind uh, security guard uh, led four seniors, which I'm proudly a member, into the vestibule of the building in which the bank is located. And, it, and we got a seat on a kind of a ledge, you know, with the distance between us. And there was a little lady um, who sat down and she reached into her, her purse and she pulled out one of those pocket-sized versions of the Old Testament and she sat there reading quietly. And then there were two other gentlemen and myself. And not long after we were sitting there, minding our own business, one of them suddenly jumped up and said, you know, from I wake up this morning, I get a message. One of us have to tell this government that Jesus is the answer. The rest of us were, were silent. So not to be deterred by our silence, he snatched off his mask and said, Uno agree with me? Jesus is the answer. If you agree with me, say amen. And the little lady reading her Leviticus looked up and said, Amen. And I thought that would have been the end of that. But no, he proceeded. You know, I, from my wake up this morning, I feel that there is a message I have for someone here this morning. I said a quiet spiritual man treatment that it wouldn't be me because I didn't feel like being engaged in any deep philosophical conversation I wanted just to get the lodgment done for the, the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. So he passed me over and he went to the other gentleman and he said, my brother, don't you agree that we need to turn, this nation need to return from it, to re repent of its evil ways and that Jesus is the answer? So the other gentleman said, well, yeah, I guess so, but to tell you the truth, you know, I don't, true, I don't too defend religion. I'm more into spirituality. Well, who tell him for say so? <laughs> you don't defend religion, you're into spirituality. What that? Obia? For those who are not familiar with, with the Jamaican culture, Obia is a form of necromancy. Um, 
that is practiced, um, have been, has been practiced for many, many year, years since slavery days in Jamaica. He say, religion, yet both spirituality and religion, what is the difference between religion and spirituality? And I never got to hear the other gentleman's response because either for better or for worse, the security guard came and said to me, come this way, and ushered me into the banking hall. But you know, friends, the message that he had really was for me. Because I found myself thinking, since then, what would have my answer been if that question had been addressed to me? What is the difference between religion and spirituality? Have many, have, have many of you said that yourself? I, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Many of us have used that phrase, but have you ever thought about what that really, really means? And so I've been thinking, and I wanted to share the answer. Or at least just to explore it a little bit with you this morning. Rabbi Rami Shapiro, writing in the March-April 2020 edition of Spirituality and Health magazine, notes the following. Quote, religion is about answers, spirituality is about questions. Religion is about answers, spirituality is about questions. Religion says Jesus is the answer. Religion says Allah is the answer. Religion says Rastafari is the answer. Religion says Buddha is the answer. And some Christians, devout as they are, say, you know, the only answer to the problem of crime is to return to hanging. That's a religious um, approach sometimes. Always offering answers. Spirituality asks questions. Questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Can I really know God? So the questions come from spirituality. And spirituality encourages us that when we get answers, we further question those answers. So that we live in the quest for a closer walk and a closer relationship with God. And you know, friends, Rabbi Shapiro says, because religion is about answers, many religions prescribe the answer and expect their, their, their members and their followers to adhere to it, to the letter. And many religious people, although not all, become belligerent when you question their own approach. On the other hand, Shapiro says that spiritually inclined people are humble. Not all, but are inclined to be humble in their questioning of their relationship with the divine. And so a friend of mine said to me recently, you know, John, I want to know what is the premise, really? What, what is the, the premise of this teaching that you, you have embraced? You walked away from Orthodox Christianity and you embraced this teaching that you have espoused and that you, you have become a minister for and that you, you teach and proclaim. What is it really? 
and he said, he asked a very spiritual question. What is the context for your belief system? So I invited him to my Thursday morning class. He lives in Washington, D.C., though, so I don't think he's going to make it this week. But I wanted him to know that the reason that I became a science of mind student and answered the call to ministry, and my call to ministry was a very interesting one, which I'll share with you in a little while, was because we teach that God, the living spirit almighty, one indestructible, absolute, and self-existent cause, that this one which manifests itself in and through all creation is the context of our teaching. God is the context of our teaching. And so my encouragement this morning is a humble inquiry into how we can find a deeper relationship with that living spirit. And the question is posed, can we really know God? You know, the relative quiet that engulfs the city during no movement days here in Kingston and in Jamaica generally, followed by nights unpolluted by air-shattering sound systems, have led me to really think about this business that the psalmist says in Psalm 46, verse 10, be still. Be still and know that I am. Or you could say it this way, be still and know that I am. God. Be still and know God. And this has been very much on my mind all these past few days. The late Jesuit mystic Father Anthony de Mello writes in his book, Sadhana, and I quote, modern man is unfortunately plagued by a nervous tension that makes it almost impossible for him to be quiet. Unquote. But the psalmist recommends that we be still. Because stillness, as Demeter says, this very quietness and stillness frequently becomes prayer, the prayer in which God manifests himself in the form of stillness. So all through, through history and in all cultures, the divine comes to us when we take time to be quiet, to be still, and to allow the still small voice within to speak to us and through us. And this is why the science of mind teaching spoke to me. And the, the synchronicity that I, I find as I study this, this transformative philosophy is just amazing. So I wanted to tell you very, very quickly about my call to ministry. I, I had no intention of being a minister. And we were on, and there are some people here who were with me, so they will remember. We were on a retreat with our founding minister of this church, Reverend Dr. Elmer Lumsden. And our guest presenter on this retreat was a wonderful soul known as Dr. Rainbow Johnson, who said to Reverend Elmer, Elmer, dear, I want you to baptize me. So Reverend Elmer said, Rainbow, you have never been baptized? She said, many, many, many times, but never in the Caribbean Sea. And of course, if you really want a baptism to end all baptisms, you need to come to Jamaica and experience our, our waters. And so she, Elma said, John Dare, find me a, a vessel. It's an interesting use of the word. 
And a voice in my head said, you are the vessel. So I went down the beach and I found half of a coconut. The coconut man had chopped it clean through and the sun had bleached it white. So this, this brownish, whitish, grayish, half a coconut shell. And I washed out the sand out of it and I took it to Reverend Elmer. And we stood in a circle, all of the, the, the practitioners, holding hands and she did this baptism to end all baptisms. It was so beautiful. You know, baptizing rainbow in the name of truth and in the name of beauty and in the name of all the good that the universe um, bestows upon us. And when Reverend Emma was finished, she said, now each of you in the circle holding hands say a prayer. And so the circle, the prayer moved around the circle. And just before it became my turn, a voice said to me, you are the vessel and you are going to baptize people with the truth and with the beauty of being. So I thought it was a person beside me, so I said, hey, what do you say? And he said, John, be quiet, quiet. So it wasn't that person, so I said, he said something to me. And the person on the other side said, John, be quiet. So I was still. I didn't know God, though I was still. End of story, part one. Now, we had a little game we used to play. We again taught by Reverend Emma that just before you go to bed at night, you just open the Bible or any kind of literature that you have and say, what do I need to know in my life right here, right now? And so just before I went to bed, I opened the Bible and I jammed my finger in and said, what do I need to know tonight? And the verse was, and I heard a voice say, whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? And I said, here am I, Lord, send me. I put on a dressing gown over my pajamas and I find myself to Reverend Elmer room. Reverend Elmer, she said, yes. I said, it's John and I need to speak to you now. She said, uh, 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 hold on, dear. And she came out, uh, opened the door and said, what is it? And I said, Reverend Elmer, I'm going to be a, a, a minister. She said, I know that, dear. I'll see you in the morning at five o'clock for meditation and close the door upon me. <laughs> so, next morning I found myself, there were no cell phones in those days, I found myself to the hotel lobby and placed a call to my mother and said, Mom, I have news for you. I'm going to be a minister. And she said, I know that, dear. Same tone of voice as Reverend Elmer. You see, when spirit says, this is the context of your life, you can only say, here am I, send me. So I want to thank the gentleman at the bank on Friday morning, because he was sent as well, and he did have a message. Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this amazing teaching called The Science of Mind, says in his textbook, and it is on about page 60, it's very early in the textbook, I quote, this science is the study of first cause spirit or the truth, the invisible essence, the ultimate stuff and intelligence from which everything comes, the power back of all creation. So what is the context for our belief system? The power back of all creation. But let me get back to this business of being still. Because the practice of being still is your assignment for this week. And you know, it's not an easy assignment. You might think, oh man, I can sit down for five or 10 minutes, as Reverend John asked. But I want to tell you that to practice being still, well, all you need to do is sit comfortably, become aware of your breathing for a few minutes, and then mentally scan your body from the top of your head down to the tips of your toes. And be very aware of any sensations you may find in any part of your body. And when you feel anything, any sensation, just say to that part, what? Be still. It can be extremely uncomfortable, my friends, for some people to be still. 
No matter how comfortable the position you have adopted for this exercise, your body is likely to protest against the stillness by developing aches or itches in various parts that you didn't know you even, you even didn't even know you had. When this happens, resist the temptation to move or to scratch or to adjust your, your posture to relieve the discomfort. Just become keenly aware of the sensations and affirm, be still, be still. And after practicing this stillness exercise for 10 or 15 minutes, my friends, write about the experience in your journal. Record what it was like for you and if anything came to you. As you become more proficient at being still, you can move on to the real aim of stillness, which is to what? To know God. But you see, you can't know God when you're, you're fishing in your handbag to say, I wonder where I put, I did put my car keys and I'm going out when I finish my prayers. Um, I need matches, you know, I'm running out of matches and I, I need something to light the stove. All of this is happening in your, in your busy mind and your body itself is twitching and w wanting to, to move because it resists being still. But you see, friends, we need to practice stillness because to know God means more than just an intellectual definition that satisfies your curious mind. Knowing God has nothing to do with being familiar with a concept of God. Because concepts and ideas and, and words and descriptions and adjectives are fine for us needing to communicate with one another. But there is a deeper knowing that is so important. It takes a genuine living realization in our hearts and our souls and our consciousness as well as in our bodies to know God or divine mind. The Aramaic scholar, Dr. and you know Aramaic was the, the language spoken by Jesus. Roka Eriko, the Aramaic scholar, tells us that in Aramaic and in Hebrew, one usually has to translate the Semitic verb yada into English as to know. However, our English equivalent of this verb as just to know does not adequately convey the Semitic meaning of to know. Remember in Genesis, we're told that Adam knew Eve and she conceived and brought forth Cain. So to Near Easterners, knowing is more experiential. And you know, I really have found in my years of studying this teaching known as the science of mind and spirit, that to understand and apprehend and comprehend the context of my life in terms of my walk as God, my walk for God, my walk in God, is I have to move the intellectual understanding down here into my heart. And when you begin to feel it, and that's why I'm asking you to do this assignment, practice being still so that you can, you can actually allow the knowing that is deeper than just intellectual thoughts to come into your heart space. Because the law is written here. This is, where it, this is where it happens, my friends. This is where you know God at the deeper, more meaningful level. And you know, it, 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 it's, people say to me, well, you can't describe God. That's so true. Any attempt to describe God limits God. In fact, you can't even describe love. Anybody here can, can give, could give me a definition of love? It's something that you experience. It's, it's an experience. Um, we have felt it, but I don't know if you can put words on it. You know, and when you say, God is love, you know, that doesn't have to do with the urge to merge and meet somebody and you think, hmm, nice. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this, this 
deep, deep yearning we have as human beings to merge with the infinite, to feel God at the very center and circumference of our lives, and therefore for our lives to become a living Bible story. And so my friends, you know, when we talk about the Bible and igniting our life with Bible wisdom and understanding the Bible, I said it to the class on, on Thursday gone, the Bible isn't a book. The Bible is a library. And that library contains many books written by many hundreds of people over many hundreds of years. You don't go to a library and expect to find every book agreeing with every other book and saying the same thing and having the same beginning and the same ending to every story. Well, if you think about the Bible in that context, it is a library of man's, and when I say man, I mean humanity's quest for the context of our existence for humanity's search for meaning. And that search begins at the center of your being, in the heart of your hearts, at the center of your consciousness. And so I want you this week to practice being still and to do what the biblical writers seem to have grasped many, many, many thousands of years ago to have a comprehensive experience, spirit, soul, and body. For knowing God means realizing truth or divine mind as a vital energy that nourishes every particle of your being. Let me repeat that for you. Knowing God means realizing truth or divine mind as a vital energy that nourishes every particle of your being. My very dear friend, Howard Daly, with what was almost his last breath before his transition, when my heart was just tearing out of my chest in grief, held my hand, looked into my eyes, and he said, don't cry, John. I know God. God, what a thing to say with your, you know, as you're about to step into your next most amazing experience of life. I know God. I know God with every cell, with every fiber, with every atom, with every sinew, with every tissue of my being. Let us say it together, I know God. Together. I know God. In the stillness, my friends, may you know God. May you apprehend that, th that deep, deep knowing that the kingdom, or as I say, the kingdom, is everywhere equally, evenly present upon the face of creation. According to the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, he said that, I quote, although God cannot be described by using concepts and notions, that does not mean you cannot experience God. And so my wish for you on this Sunday morning is that as you practice stillness, you come to know God. There's a, 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 a Buddhist, no, I think it's a Hindu parable, about uh, four blind men feeling an elephant. You may know it. And the one at the, at the tusk said, the elephant is like a cold stone. And the one feeling the, the, the hide said, elephant is like a rough tree bark. And the one at the tail said, no, it's a soft broom. And the one that had his hand on the elephant's mouth said, no, an elephant is like a warm spring full of running water. None of them, and the elephant is a metaphor for, for God, eh? In, in, the, in the Hindu um, tradition. And so, and I love elephants, by the way. Um, none of them individually could describe the elephant. Can you imagine if they put their ideas together and asked the spiritual question? 
if they each shared what they knew of God, wouldn't they have a much more composite picture of what we're all seeking? And this, my friends, is really the value of belonging to spiritual community. This is my shameless commercial. If you are looking for a spiritual home, somewhere where you can explore the questions that we have come to earth to find answers for, join us at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in the quest to answer those questions and to share our discovery. I think of us all as being on a, on a, on a mountain, a mountain climb. I love the metaphor of a mountain. And on the mountain, maybe with families out on an outing, and people are at different levels of the development of their faith. And I don't mean to suggest that one level is higher or better than another, because at every level of our development, there is beauty, there is deep learning, and there is meaning. But if we can share the experience, and one person on the mountain would say, you know, we're on the ledge that I was standing on. The sunset was just amazing. And another one said, I was able to almost touch the clouds. I was so high up. I, the air was so pure. If we put all of those experiences together, what a joyous expression it would be. And so I want to just invite you to share with us in community. Come online. If you are in Jamaica, come see us and know the stillness and the beauty and the purpose of asking the questions of each other and of the indwelling intelligence that has an answer for all that you seek. So may you come to know God, my friends, as your greater self, as the inner light that lights your path to the attainment of your very highest ideals and goals. May God be the, the great friend of your lives, helping you at all times to understand how very precious you are to life. And when you find that stillness, and feel that presence, there will be no need, as the desiderata asked us, to strive to be happy, because the joy of the Lord will be yours. Namaste. Thank you so much, Reverend John. That was an extended answer in many, many parts about how to know God. And one of the main ways that we heard was something we heard quite often. Be still and know God. And you know God through the experience mainly of God. And we heard also Apart from Reverend John's interesting decision to become a minister, we heard that in a general way, religion is dogmatic and it is about answers, whereas spirituality is much more humble and it is about asking questions. Thanks again, Reverend John. <laughs>